Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to a new episode of EVE Echoes. Tonight on Bedtime Stories and Lore we will be tackling part 3 of the Golden Age short stories and we've left the two best stories for last because they are indeed amazing. Unfortunately one of them is not properly portrayed in the game and I'd like to touch on that as well. But for now let us dive deep into the Galente Caldari War. A war that lasted for a hundred years, culminating with the sacrifice of the Kaldari admiral Yakia Tovil Toba, and ended with the founding of Concord. Because you see, by the time the Galente Federation was founded two centuries ago, the Kaldari corporations were already well established in Kaldari society. Kaldari Prime and Galente Prime shared the same system. Shortly after Jumpgate technology was jointly discovered, by the Galente and the Kaldari, a little over 500 years before the Federation formed, the Kaldari corporations had started their own interstellar surveying and colonization, separate from that conducted by the Galente. It was these colonies, kept as a secret from the Galenteans, that became the source of friction between the Galenteans and the Kaldari, culminating in the latter's defection from the Federation and an ensuing war between two races. It all started when a Galente exploration ship happened upon one of the hidden Kaldari colonies. When the Federation Senate learned of this, they demanded a full-scale investigation into the matter and that all hidden Kaldari colonies should immediately be put under Federation authority. But this was too much for the Kaldari corporations, which were already grumbling over increasing Federation interference into their own affairs. For the Kaldari, it was a simple question of losing their autonomy forever by caving in or making a stand right then and there. They decided to make a stand. What made the situation so tense right from the start was the situation on Kaldari Prime, being located in the same solar system as Galente Prime, made Galenteans very nervous and more importantly, a sizable Galentean population was already living on Kaldari Prime. Right after the Kaldari defected from the Federation, they focused on securing the jump gates leading to their once hidden bases, as those bases provided the backbone to the Kaldari military infrastructure at the time. Meanwhile, the Galenteans moved their fleet into orbit around Kaldari Prime and started a blockade around the planet. For the next few days, nothing much happened. The Kaldari were content to sit by the jump gates while the Galenteans were debating on how to best negotiate a peace agreement. But the Kaldari and Kaldari Prime were restless. They found the Galente blockade intolerable and soon small-scale guerrilla activities escalated into all-out hostilities. In the end, the Galente population on the planet had to pay the price for the Federation's indecisiveness. The turning point came when Kaldari partisans sabotage the glass dome of the Galente inhabited underwater city of Nouvelle Revenor. More than half a million perished. From then on, a lengthy bloody war between the two races was all but inevitable. The Federation retaliated at once by sending an invasion force down to Kaldari Prime and began a systematic orbital bombardment of the planet. Soon, the Kaldari population had been driven to the mountains and the forests, the resistance getting weaker by the day. The only question was, how would the newly formed Kaldari state respond? Following the attack on Nouvelle Revenor, an extreme right-wing government grabbed the power reins in the Galente Federation and advocated a harsh response, bombing Kaldari Prime and sending in troops to take control of the planet. Those within the Federation believing that peace talks should be initiated instead of an invasion did not dare speak up, mostly out of fear of being branded cowards or worse traitors. The Galente war machine grinded into gear. It soon became obvious that it was a question of when, not if, the Galenteans would take full control of the planet. The newly formed Kaldari government, led by the heads of the corporations, was far from being in full agreement as to what the correct course of action was. The disagreement, which severely hampered the Kaldari state in following a coherent strategy, was only settled after the morning of reasoning, when the six most militant corporations jointly ousted the other CEOs from power. The Kaldari saw 
that it was impossible to try to fight the much larger Galenta Federation for control of Kaldari Prime. Instead, they started devising a plan to evacuate the Kaldari population on the planet. For the plan to work, an evacuation window of at least one month had to be created by the Kaldari Navy. It had to keep the Galente fleet occupied and away from the planet for this period of time to allow the thousands of civilians and cargo vessels gathered for the evacuation to operate safely. The Kaldari High Command knew their fleet was heavily outnumbered and outgunned by the Galente fleet, but they put their faith in several advantages. First, the surprise factor would help them in the initial stages. Secondly, the ferocity of the Kaldari personnel fighting for their home and their families would carry them through a lot of hardship. And thirdly, the Galente ships orbiting Kaldari Prime were large and cumbersome, little more than shooting platforms ideal for orbital bombardment. The Kaldari hoped their small, fast one man fighters would run circles around Galente ships. It is doubtful whether the above-mentioned advantages had sufficed for the Kaldari, but they enjoyed one further advantage that they knew nothing about. The extreme right-wing faction that held the reins of power in the Federation was getting paranoid. They saw conspirators in every corner and started firing prominent figures from the administration and army, replacing them with eager yes-men with little experience and even less initiative. The result was total chaos in the Galente war effort. This chaos was not enough to completely halt the military operations on and around Kaldari Prime, but it made the Galente fleet and army ill-prepared for any drastic changes. It was thus with a relative ease that the Kaldari fleet managed to take control of the orbital zones of Kaldari Prime and drive the Galente fleet back. Even the most optimistic of the Kaldari were taken by surprise and there were even talks that the Kaldari fleet should continue to Galente Prime and repay the Galenteans by bombing their home planet. But the more level-headed of the Kaldari knew that decisively defeating the Galente home fleet was impossible. Indeed, it would be hard enough to defend against it once it arrived to reclaim the space around Kaldari Prime, so instead the Kaldari High Command quickly set into motion their evacuation program and soon millions of Kaldari were leaving the planet for the new homes. Two weeks had passed. More than half the Kaldari population was still on the planet. Both sides employed dozens of scout ships to gauge the strength and intentions of the other. It was becoming obvious to the Kaldari that the Galenteans were preparing a massive assault on Kaldari Prime to drive the Kaldari out and resume their military conquest of the planet. A new plan was needed. Days passed and desperation began seeping in. The Galente attack was imminent. Finally, the Kaldari Admiral Yakyato Viltoba took matters into his own hands. He led the few dozen ships he commanded and jumped to Galente Prime. Before the stunned Galenteans could respond, he had attacked and destroyed a few stray Galente ships, but the Galenteans were quick to recover and before long, Admiral Toviltoba was on the run but he managed to beat the advancing Galente ships off and retreat to the moon of Floro. The Galenteans stopped their pursuit to gather their forces and lick their wounds. The two fleets clashed again the next day, and again Admiral Toviltoba showed his remarkable tactical skills and managed to withdraw relatively unscathed. Toviltoba played this game of cat and mouse with the Galenteans for a whole week, except that he was in the role of the mouse. Eventually, one of his ships remained, a badly damaged fighter carrier. In his dying breath, Toviltoba directed the huge vessel down towards Galente Prime. On entering the atmosphere, the ship broke into several burning pieces, killing all aboard. But the largest of these pieces reached the ground and one of them hit the city of Huomon, killing roughly two million people. Admiral Toviltoba and his crew sacrificed themselves in order for millions more Kaldari to escape. To this day, he is revered as a national hero, and his name is one of the first things every Kaldari child learns. The story of Admiral Yakiato Viltoba and his sacrifice for the Kaldari people to evacuate Kaldari Prime is marked by three corresponding trinkets in the Golden Age commemoration. The Carrier Intelligent Assistant. It appears that its item had belonged to the Kairiola Carrier. It's currently on display in a museum in New Kaldari, the Kaldari people's new home planet.
The ship it belonged to was completely destroyed in battle. The AI still remembers the name of its master, a Navy Admiral. The second item relates to the Kaldari news report. As the Kaldari commemorate the anniversary of their independence and remember Yakya Tovil Toba's sacrifice. The third and final item of this story is marked by Navy Admiral's Medal, a relic of the past. Moving over to the second story of today and the last story of the Golden Age commemoration. This is the story of Otro Garyushi, a Kaldari capsuleer which became the CEO of Ishikone Corporation in YC-100 until his death in YC-110. When Otro Garyushi was still a child, his father, Villamo, moved the family to the underdeveloped mining world of Junali 7 to partake in Ishikone's latest industrial-scale mining operations. The family settled in the town of Kuriku Junction. Otro's life in Drenali 7 was tumultuous. This had the benefit of conditioning him to be prepared to handle the worst possible outcome of any situation. Following their mother's tragic death in an industrial incident, Otro's older sister, Mila, could not reconcile her personal conflicts with their father and choose to leave the family becoming estranged from both Oro and their father. Otro was five when Mila left. By YC-90, Ishikone's operations in Dranali 7 had been largely abandoned, creating difficult living conditions on the planet. Unbeknownst to the 16-year-old Otro at the time, this forced his father to deal drugs for the Garistas to earn enough money to pay rent and help his son attain his life goals. At the time, Otro aspired to join the Kaldari Navy. Being intellectually gifted as well as ambitious, he stood a good chance of being accepted to the School of Applied Knowledge. Otro's relationship with his father was at times contentious, but despite this, Otro viewed his father as a rock upon which his own comprehension of the world was built. Philemon taught him to be resilient in the face of adversity, which was a key to surviving in harsh conditions such as those on Drenali 7. As Otra grew into a teenager, their relationship became a strong, independent bond. After Villamo was murdered by an Ishikone executive, Otra briefly considered taking his own life. However, his father's Garistus contact, a man known as Gavriel, convinced him otherwise and took Otra in. Subsequently, Otra never applied to the Kaldari Navy, but instead joined the ranks of the Garistus pirates. While within the Garistas ranks, he proved himself to be a capable addition. Otro survived numerous altercation in which he suffered various injuries to his face and body, most notably a broken jaw which never healed properly and left him with what others termed spectacularly ugly features. Otro also adapted a recognizable skull and crossbones tattoo across his right cheek. In return for his loyalty, the Garistas provided implants and the necessary training to make Otro a capsuleer. But by YC-100, Otro's pirate activities had taken a turn, leading him and his followers to be seen as traitors by Jirai Fatal, one of the Garistas' co-founders. Because Otro was heavily involved into spying, deciphering and collecting information that spewed out of Vishikone, he started going rogue. And because of that, Fatal wanted him eliminated for threatening the extremely profitable relationship that the Garistas shared with Ishikone. Otro had been systematically targeting Ishikone vessels across all of its shipping operations. Indeed, Otro had a grudge against Ishikone for the harsh conditions on the planet he grew up and for the murder of his father. While plundering Ishikone ships, Otro stumbled upon an unexpected discovery. One of the passengers in a ship he had just boarded was Mila, who had been living under an assumed name. This event reunited the brother and sister. But Mila accused Otro of indiscriminate abduction and torture. However, Otro explained that his actions had been aimed only at Ishikone personnel and their business associates, while the indiscriminate killing is up to the rest of the Garistas organization. As Otro replied to Mila then and there, you don't have to shoot a man to take away his life. You can kill without ever striking your victim or firing a weapon. All you have to do is take away his hope. Take away a man's sense of purpose in life, the rock that his ego rests upon, and that man becomes the living dead. Ishikone killed hundreds of thousands of people by doing exactly that, 
and they're still doing it as we speak, by drawing them out to the deep, where they don't have to answer to the state or anyone else, luring them with promises of prosperity and success, and then snatching it all away. With the help of Mila, who had joined his cause, Otro was able to quickly reconstruct the financial history of Vishikone based on the intercepted data that he managed to decrypt. This revealed, with astonishing detail, the current Ishikone CEO, Les Akilin, and his gross corruption. It appears that Akilin provided stolen competitor shipping itineraries to the Garistas in return for the pirates leaving Ishikone vessels alone. Additionally, Ishikone purchased cargo recovered from the ships the Garistas ransomed or salvaged at cost, effectively breaking open Ishikone's profit margin. Mila's assistance also revealed the existence of Ishikone's new Raven-class battleship prototype, secretly created by Ishikone's chief financial officer. Recognizing the potential of this ship, combined with what they learned about the corporation, Otra transformed the scope of his crusade from one of guerrilla war to one of surgical strikes, with anticipated, quantifiable, long-term consequences. Before he was able to set his plan in motion, Otro's forces were ambushed by Garissa's fleet that were still on the hunt for him. Otro managed to escape in his pod and was able to convince Ishikone's CFO to see his point of view regarding Ishikone. In return, the CFO agreed to let Otro pilot the prototype Raven in a test demonstration before the Kaldari Navy and the Ishikone board of directors that would simultaneously allow Otro to engage the Garissa's forces directly in order to free Mila, which had been captured by the Garistas. With the help of the Raven prototype, Otro was able to completely defeat the Garista forces and then started negotiations with Fatal, the Ishikone board and admirals of the Kaldari Navy, which all culminated with the exposure of Achillin's treachery. All knowledge of this disgrace and the events pertaining to it were kept private and declared highly classified state secret. In view of his actions and the information he revealed, Ishikone's board of directors then voted unanimously to name Otra as the next CEO of Ishikone, while Mila became the corporation's CFO. In the weeks following the public introduction of the Raven, Otra quickly earned himself a reputation as Kaldari first leader, winning the respect of rival corporations and mending the bitterness caused by his predecessor. His remarkable work ethic and humane treatment of citizens under his corporation, including unprecedented reparations paid to individuals affected by the mishandled mining operation in the Fade region, impressed the Kaldari state, earning Otra near celebrity status in the state. The prominent skull and crossbones tattoo on his cheekbone and spectacularly ugly features ensured he cut an unusual figure at business meetings a fact he played to his advantage. In secret, Otra had also been researching a cure that had plagued the Minmatar for so long, the Vitok drug. The drug that the Amar used on their Minmatar slaves in order to keep them in check. Without taking Vitok, you would die. With Vitok at their disposal, the Amar had a tight grip on the Minmatar population still enslaved within the Amarian Empire, while the Minmatar Republic could do nothing to save their brothers. Otro had developed a secret location where the Insorum booster would soon to be created, and open up talks with San Matar Maleatu Shakor to give the Minmatar Republic a cure for Vitok to allow the Minmatar to free their brothers. However, in YC-110, things would take a darker turn. YC-10 is marked by a single important event, the Kaldari Construction's Armor Forge riots. During those riots, a single man was able to raise his fist against the oppressive Kaldari state-held mining operations. That man was Tibus Heth. Yes, that Tibus Heth that would rise to be the head of the Kaldari state and run it with an iron grip. But Tebus Heth was not able to do this on his own. He had help. A mysterious figure called the Broker provided him with information and financial sustainability. The Broker is a very shady character. 
He has been directly or indirectly involved in various dealings between states, prominent warlords or intelligence agencies. The Broker is a master of disguise who utilizes the latest in cloning and DNA technology to keep his appearances a secret. No one knows how he looks like in reality. But he seemed to have been taken a keen interest in the rise of Tibuseth, a puppet that he might control for his own benefits and gains. And the rise to prominence of Tibuseth was continuing. Otro made a national appeal for calm and restraint to the whole state, telling them, we are united in purpose, but we must never, ever be united in hate. This call for peace was well received and prompted the Galente president at the time, Sora Foyriton, to organize a diplomatic summit with Otro to be held aboard the corporation's headquarters station in the Malkalan system. However, the broker assisted Tibuseth rise to power by directly getting involved in the peace summit. The broker having assumed the cloned appearance of respected Galente Admiral Alexander Noir, used the Federation delegation flagship, the Nix class Wandering Saint, to ram the Ishikone Corporation's headquarters stationed in Malkalan. The resulting explosion killed an excess of 600,000 people, including Otro Garyushi. Unfortunately, the Ishikone headquarters contained all of Otro Garyushi's clones inside the VAT clone bay, and with the explosion of the station, Otro Garyushi was dead for good. It would seem that the broker's motive for this act was unknown even to Otro himself, who had for some time been in negotiation with San Mata Maliatu Shako over in Sorum, the antidote for Vitok. It was developed by Shikone as the next big pipeline product. The broker had also been bidding on Insorum, massively outbidding the Minmitar. Otro refused the broker's offer and ultimately turned the antidote over to Shakur and the elders for free. Because you see, the broker was suffering from a terminal, irreversible condition affecting all of his clones and their master template. The problem with Capsuleer technology, once you go Capsuleer and your clones are created, your genetic fingerprint is instantiated. This includes all of your diseases and defects. Being denied access to Insorum, the broker vowed to destroy Otro and all his work, hijacking Noir's body and the Wandering Say to achieve that end. Tibuseth was quick to pounce upon Otro's death to mobilize the Kaldari. Heth's directorate made very sure that reminders of the Malkalan catastrophe and the Armour Forge riots were close at hand. Shortly afterwards, the state was motivated and ready for the assault on Kaldari Prime. The new war was about to begin. Mila Garyoshi managed to survive the incident and is currently in hiding at an undisclosed location of the Insorum production facility. Ultra's final wish that the Insorum antidote be given to Maliatu Shako at no charge was honored and with it the elders launched their invasion of the Amar Empire, allowing the Minmata Republic to free most of their enslaved brethren. This story is marked by three correlating trinkets in the Golden Age commemoration. The Insorum booster, the recording of Ultra's call, which is not actually canon. I've already told you the story, which is canon, and this conversation is not part of it. And the third item is the Corporation CEO's business card. If you'd like to understand more about what happened in YC-110, how Tibus Heth came to power, how Otro's dealing with the broker and with Insorum in a more explained and developed uh, narrative, I highly recommend you read the book called The Imperian Age. It's pretty awesome. It's kind of cheap. You can find it on Amazon or Best Booksellers. Just look it up on Google and enjoy the read. It's, it's actually pretty cool. That's it for today. I hope you learned something. Thank you guys for watching. A very big shout out to my channel supporters and I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.